Hello and welcome to this lecture everybody. This is our sort of course introduction and introduction to key concepts and metaphors for monuments and memory. We'll talk some about the key terms and concepts you'll be expected to know and utilize in this class and consider some key metaphors for analyzing monuments and memorials that I hope you'll find helpful to incorporating in both your discussion and your writing and analysis uh, as we look at different case studies of monuments and memorials. So some key terms and concepts include things like collective memory. What is a monument or a memorial in the first place? What's a memorial landscape? Okay, site and situation. How are those uh, important to understanding the sort of surrounding environmental context of a monument? What is memory work? What is counter memory and reparative memory? How are these similar and different terms? These are some of the terms that we'll get into. So let's start off by just looking at this first one, collective memory. What is collective memory? Collective memory includes the memories, experiences, rituals, and relationships with and to the past held in common by a group. They're important for identity formation and usually contested in some way, right? You might be imagining that not every person that's a part of uh, a possible group holds the same relationship to a monument or memorial or the same ideas about monuments and memorials. Uh, collective memory allows groups of individuals to hold on to familiar experiences and attachments to places and, uh, and events across generations. So it's something that creates place attachment, creates space for attaching um, a sort of collective psychology or collective effervescence or essence <laughs> um, to a place or a monument or memorial. And we can think about these in terms of like national holidays, songs, and anthems, right? Uh, in 2016, the uh, Colin Kaepernick situation with kneeling for the national anthem in the National Football League created tons of controversy and revealed tensions around uh, both collective group and, you know, different individual perspectives on what the, what the anthem means and how we should make sense of it, how we should honor or not honor it, revere or not revere it, uh, or critique it at the same time that we also hold some significance for it, right? Um, you see similar issues come up around the Martin Luther King national holiday, right? A lot of people have different ideas about how Dr. King should be commemorated, uh, under what circumstances, and who has the right to commemorate Dr. King on that holiday, okay? And collective memory can be contrasted somewhat with both personal individual memories and with formal history, right? When we talk about collective memory, we're talking about the way that groups of people think and act uh, and remember, and not just, you know, an individual um, story or situation, which is important. And certainly individual and personal memories make up collective memory, uh, but also are significantly different than the way that collective attachments form uh, onto and with memories. And we're also not necessarily talking about formal history as a historical discipline, right? Collective memory is about much more than uh, sort of what professional historians do. It, it's, uh, you know, professional historians are all about interpreting the past in a particular way, creating an archive, creating a record, capturing in some cases, as objectively as possible, what happened in the past. In other cases, providing, you know, a certain theoretical interpretation of the past, right? Um, these things are, are certainly related, but collective memory is much more about how groups of people think about the past and not necessarily um, a, a formal historical scholarship process. Okay, and you'll hear people say public memory in addition to um, collective memory. They're often often similar. I would say they're maybe not exactly the same because collective memory um, has a lot to do with groups of people that may or may not be part of um, or may or may not be uh, included in the definition of public. Public memory takes on uh, some of the similar themes and concepts of collective memory but is often focused specifically around what happens in public places for commemoration, 
right? And so you can imagine how collective memory shapes what takes place at a cemetery, for example. But if that cemetery is not in a public space, maybe public memory is not the best way to describe what takes place in terms of commemoration at the, at the private cemetery. Just as an example. So you'll hear the two terms inter used interchangeably, but public takes on the connotation of uh, public, right? Um, in terms of how to define monuments and memorials, it's not always easy, right? This group that we'll refer to a fair amount called Monument Lab uses the definition, a statement of power and presence in public, which I think is, is a nice and, and may, an interesting definition, but it's maybe not um, as specific <laughs> as we might like for it to be. It, it doesn't include anything about a physical monument or stone. It also doesn't make reference to place names or historical plaques, although it certainly includes them. Um, a statement of power and presence in public could also be, um, you know, a speech that gets given in public, which we may or may not consider a monument or memorial. So this is, I would say, the broadest possible definition, and there are certainly others. Okay, Monuments and memorials are, of course, often associated with physical monuments made of steel or stone and in, in the likeness of a single individual, such as, uh, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a a Robert E. Lee, a Rosa Parks, uh, you know, whoever that individual may be. But monuments and memorials are also, of course, much more than that. can take on various forms, both physical and non-physical um, as well. And memorial can sometimes be considered a broader term than monument in that it captures things like historical marker plaques, you know, street or building names, um, a monument often has that traditional association, again, with something that's physical and concrete, although it doesn't have to be. Um, sometimes a memorial is just an easier way to capture a wider swath of commemorative features that we want to capture. Okay, and importantly for this class, you know, we'll focus on the fact that monuments and memorials are designed to commemorate something or someone in the past. So when we're talking about monuments and memorials, that's what we're talking about. Okay. An example of a monument or memorial could be this, this one here. Now, you're only seeing a small um, part of the actual physical monument that exists not too far from the St. Paul or the Minnesota State Capitol building in St. Paul, but it's called the Soldiers and Sailors Monument. And if you've never heard of it, I encourage you to do a little research, check it out. We might even be able to see it when we go visit the Minnesota State Capitol. Uh, but it's one of very few monuments, actually, that is dedicated to the Civil War, but not about the Confederacy. This is actually a monument to Union soldiers who fought in the Civil War. Okay. Another example of a memorial, clearly, that we have already begun discussing a little bit in this class and that we'll jump into more is, um, you know, the example of Neal Hall, formerly known as Neal Hall, which is now the Humanities Building on McAllister's campus. So we'll talk a little bit about how place names serve as commemorative markers or memorials uh, in a lot of different ways. And as well, of course, you can think about the various historical plaques um, that exist throughout the country, throughout the Twin Cities, right? We have an example here of the Como Harriet streetcar line. And this historical plaque actually is, it's not a, it's not really a place name. It's not really a physical monument in the sense that it doesn't take on the likeness of an individual person. It is physical, of course, in the sense that there's a sign with text on it. And this is an interesting example of a memorial because this one explicitly takes on an explanatory role of telling a story. It actually has text literally physically written on it in a way that, you know, the Soldiers and Sailors Monument really doesn't, right? It may tell a story, but it doesn't have physical text written on it. And so we'll talk a little bit about what are some of the similarities and differences between different kinds of memorials. What kinds of storytelling capacities do they have? What kinds of you know, geographic navigational um, purposes do they take on, right? For example, you, know, you can take down a physical monument and remove it and put nothing in its place, and that's probably fine uh, in terms of your ability to get around the city or navigate to the location where that is. But if we took the Neil, Neil Hall name off of the building and didn't give it a replacement, 
right? How would students know where their classes in that building are? How would they be able to navigate to them? So place names, street names, building names often have this navigational um, component to them where they sort of need to be replaced in a way that monuments can be replaced, physical monuments can be replaced, but may not have the same practical requirement. right along let's talk a little bit about site and situation as concepts so these are similar but um, not exactly the same concept site refers to the absolute location of a monument or memorial in other words an address or a latitude and longitude that can help you find it on a map or on earth's surface somewhere whereas the situation refers more to its relative location in other words to the context surrounding where it's located and its relationship to those surroundings. Okay, so every monument and memorial exists in some sort of situation. It's not located in some blank, empty space without a historical context, without a social and cultural and political context. All right, so that's something that we'll want to consider as we think about monuments and memorials. The relationships that these monuments have to their surroundings shapes the meanings and interpretations that people attach to them in collective memory, okay? We can think of monuments as part of a, a wider memorial landscape context. They exist in a context. You might even think that, that they exist in the context of all <laughs> that is and all that came before them. In other words, they did not fall out of coconut trees. They exist in a context, and that context helps helps to shape how communities think about them and make sense of them and why they come to matter uh, and make sense to those communities in sometimes different ways. Okay? I use the term memorial landscape. What does that mean? That's really referring to a physical space that's imbued with some cultural significance and has social meanings that are attached to the past. It may or may not contain physical monuments, memorials, and markers that reference the past, um, but it typically contains some reference to the past in some way and is a physical space. Okay could be a site of an annual or regular gathering for rituals of remembrance. Um, and again, it may hold importance to different people for different reasons. Okay, so we can think about monuments and memorials and place names as all existing within this wider landscape context, what some people have even called a memory scape. Okay, I didn't say that here, but you can think of the wider memorial landscape context as, as a memory scape. And we'll talk a little bit about why that matters. The important thing from this slide is that memorial landscapes always involve selections or decisions about what to include, what to exclude, what to highlight, or what to decenter when we're thinking about and commemorating the past. For example, this is a statue of a Confederate soldier outside of a local county courthouse. And for you to think about this in terms of the context of the wider memorial landscape that it lives in, you think about how this monument might be received differently by different groups of people based on its location, right? If, it, if this monument, for example, was located in uh, a private cemetery and not on the courthouse, would it have the same meaning? Being located next to a courthouse is being located next to a seat of power, of local power at the very least, That's, that gives it a sort of stamp or an, an officialness, if you will, an authorization to it that says, this is how my local government and the local powers that be view the past and view this person as worthy of veneration or view this cause or this view of the past as worthy of celebration and highlighting. And I mean, it can be argued that if this was on, on someone's private property or in a private cemetery, it might not have that same meaning. It also might not carry that same weight um, for, you know, for the public uh, who maybe walks by this to do business at the courthouse or uh, 
cares about you know what gets put up in their communities okay so location is important landscape context is important you can also think a little bit about how the event itself that gets commemorated takes place within a certain context this is a, a photograph of a confederate festival that takes place in the interior of sao paulo brazil which is where i did my dissertation field work and um, the festival that that takes place here celebrating the confederacy clearly happens in a, a separate but related cultural context to you know the local courthouse in murfreesboro tennessee that i just showed you there um, and so one of the things we'll want to think about in this class is how do commemorations move and take shape differently across regional and national borders? How do different versions of the past or, or how actually do the same events of the past come to matter and make sense differently to different people in different places? Um, so again, this is part of that memorial landscape context. Okay, and this additionally is um, a place name that is attempting to reconcile a previous street name that commemorated a white supremacist. Uh, this is located in Tulsa where the infamous race massacre um, happened of, in 1921 and the street was formally commemorating someone named Tate Brady who was a white supremacist who um, was one of the sort of starters or insiders of the race riot or race massacre there against uh, African Americans who lived in Tulsa in, the, in 1921. And so one of the things that we will want to think about maybe in this class is how does the landscape that surrounding this area um, and, and the people who live and work in this area influence the process of renaming a street? For example, in the background, you can see a building that's being built here. Well, part of the backstory of this street getting renamed is that the business owners on the streets really did not want it to be renamed. They wanted it to stay Brady. And members of the community, especially African-American members of Tulsa's um, Greenwood neighborhood, where the massacre took place, really wanted to see a specific person um, replace the old Brady name on the street. And they ended up having to sort of compromise with these local business owners who were um, in a, a very gentrifying area, right, who are mostly white, mostly wealthy business owners who did not really want the name to change. And so the reconciliation was kind of the compromise that had to take place or that took place between these two groups. So we'll talk a little bit about um, how The interests of people who are vying for re this renaming, um, how their interests um, take on power in uneven ways, right? Community members and grassroots organizations often may not have the same influence with local government that business owners have, for example. Um, and so that influences the outcome. And, and the community doesn't always get what they want because they may have to compromise with the owners business owners or other powerful actors influencing a, a commemorative landscape. And speaking of grassroots community groups, you know, these groups often build a lot of capacity and put in a lot of work to see change happen in the memorial landscape. So we refer to this work that gets done, whether it's from below from community groups or from above from other you know, nonprofits or, or businesses or local governments um, as memory work, right? So any effort to create new forms of collective memory, build some sort of social capacity or lay claim to a sense of belonging in the landscape um, is part of a process of memory work that requires time. It requires effort, energy and resources to build that capacity to do educational programming, to advocate for why they believe the change should happen and develop and craft new narratives about the past. And again, memory work is not necessarily something only done from below by community organizations. It can be, you know, it can occur from above, it can occur from below. 
by individuals and organizations with varying levels of power to enact commemorative change. So we can think about commemory, uh, commemorative work or memory work in a lot of different ways. It can be uh, unauthorized or informal, as shown here, where there's clearly graffiti that has been you know, put onto this statue. Um, some people refer to this as like a form of political vandalism, where in many cases, you know, and this is something that we'll hear about what happened with the, the Christopher Columbus statue that got taken down um, on the Minnesota State Courthouse grounds. Communities advocate, and they, they do a lot of work to try to go through the legal process, the, the authorized means of getting something removed. And after sometimes years of capacity building, they're still not able to make the change that they want to make, and they get frustrated. And so, you know, they come out and just graffiti something because that frustration with the process not working for them. Um, so I think political vandalism is a very, you know, legitimate way of, of protesting, of saying, hey, we're, we're doing this capacity building, this, this reform that we want to see happen, and we're not being heard, we're not being listened to. And so we're going to make sure that somebody sees that we're trying to do this work and that we want it to be taken down. Okay. It can also be simpler. It doesn't have to be, you know, graffiti can be somewhat extreme sometimes, but uh, it could be simpler than that. It could be as simple as putting up a sign that renames a building such as this one, which was renamed um, at Columbia in summer of 2024 as a response to, or as part of the campus occupations in protest of Columbia's support for and, and inve financial investments in the Israeli genocide of Palestinians in Gaza. Now, this building was in particular was renamed Heinz Hall after um, a young girl whose name was Hind, who was, who was unfortunately killed in the genocide. Um, and we have, have seen actually similar examples of this on McAllister's own campus Right when we went to the campus archives, we saw where an informal renaming took place of various buildings um, in protest of Columbus Day um, in the, or Indigenous Peoples Day, and some of those actually still stand. If you go into the Humanities Building and take a look outside the American Studies Department office, you'll still still see uh, Teo Te Duda's Hall's name outside there from that. That protest. I actually saw this in some of my own research too at the University of North Carolina, um, when there was there were some protests going on there, and I believe it was 2017, and some students informally renamed a building to Hurston Hall after Zora Neale Hurston, the first African American who informally attended the university in a time when African Americans were barred from attending the university. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about the North Carolina case, just let me know. I'll be happy to send you some information on that. But um, these are these are kinds of memory work, along with actually um, performances and rituals. So something like a candlelight vigil, for example, that maybe has um, you know a speaker or music or any kind of uh, laying of flowers, laying of reeds, hanging of banners. You know, you can see there's the, obviously the mural of George Floyd. This is George Floyd Square, square clearly in Minneapolis. Um, these sort of commemorative rituals are also about memory work, right? They're also about capacity building. Um, and so these are one of the other ways that we can think about memory work as happening from below. It doesn't have to be necessarily just you know, graffiti or, or informal renaming, although those are certainly types of memory work. It could also be, um, you know, a ritual or a commemorative event or process that, that takes place. So to summarize, right, we have site and situation. We have the context of a monument and its surroundings. Okay, monuments don't live in blank empty spaces. They don't fall out of coconut trees. Okay, we have memorial landscape, which is also referring to this context, which may or may not have physical monuments or markers and may hold different kinds of importance to different kinds of people. 
and um, they're always involving selections about what to include and what to exclude by developers in the real estate world, by local officials in zoning and planning, and by community groups who advocate for change to the, the memorial landscape. And finally, we talked about memory work, which is really all about capacity building. It's about work, resources, time, effort, and energy used to create new kinds of memorial landscapes. And we saw these in several different instances. We'll leave it there for now and follow up in a separate uh, lecture on monuments and memory that covers the different metaphors that I want to cover. Stay tuned for more.